I've had the pleasure for the last uh, almost 24 hours now uh, to uh, be the host uh, for Georg Kell, who is here this evening, and we're very privileged to uh, have him with us, knowing something of his schedule as we've conversed today. I, it's lucky that we've got him in the same hemisphere for this long, uh, and uh, we appreciate the sacrifice he's made to be here. Uh, Georg Kell is executive director of the UN Global Compact, the world's largest voluntary corporate sustainability initiative, with 7,000 corporate participants in 135 countries. A key architect of the Global Compact, Kell has led the initiative since its founding in the year 2000 establishing the most widely recognized multi-stakeholder network and action platform to advance responsible business practices. He also oversaw the conception and launch of the Global Compact's sister initiatives on investment and business education. The Principles for Responsible Investment, or PRI, and the Principles for Responsible Management Education, PRME. Beginning his career as a research fellow in engineering at the renowned Fraunhofer Institute for Production, Technology, and Innovation in Berlin, he then worked as a financial analyst in various countries in Africa and Asia, joining the UN in 1987. Kell has been at the leading edge of the organization's private sector engagement ever since. A native of Germany, he received advanced degrees in economics and engineering from the Technical University of Berlin. It's my pleasure to introduce and our pleasure now to hear from Georg Kell. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for this wonderful introduction. It's very, very humbling uh, to be here in front of you. I know this institute is a great place for thoughts, thought leadership, and the cultivation of thought leadership. So I'm very privileged to be here. I'm also very pleased to meet good old friends here again who have passed through New York or other places and who are here now today. The subject I want to share with you this evening is really the role of business in development in global affairs, the role of business as a possible ethical force for good, the importance of linking long-term thinking with practical steps today. And I want to do so by sharing with you a little bit the philosophy and the evolution and the way how the UN Global Compact works. For those of you students who have been examining the question of business and development, this will be especially helpful, I hope, because it shows that it's also in the business interest to find practical solutions on many, many of the challenges we are facing. But more importantly, business is the force for development. Most of the poverty reduction we have witnessed in the past 20 years have to do with private sector investment. Indeed, I would argue and saying no successful development without business growth. In the end, successful development means sufficient, sufficient private investment to enable broad-based growth. So when asked sometimes, so what is the role of business in development? When business asks me that, I say three things. Invest, be successful, create jobs, and do so in a responsible manner. Do not just create a vodka capitalism or shortcuts. That's not a foundation for long-term growth. Do it in a responsible manner. And with this short introduction, I want to carry you a little bit through the thoughts behind the Global Compact. And it's actually very simple at its core. We live in a world of deepening interdependence, technological change, communication, ideas. They travel fast. And the old system of nation states, where you could fully hide just behind your national boundary, are in some ways over. Indeed, business has long gone global. Governments still are local. That means the more interdependence deepens, the more global integration as a management concept, as an investment concept, gains pace. And it clearly has done so 
in very important ways over decades and has accelerated over the last two decades, the more the public and the private interest overlaps, and that is key. I use, put, use here the United Nations as a public interest and the private sector business, but you could also substitute the United Nations with a nation state or even a local uh, uh, authority, a city. Business cannot succeed in societies that fail. At some level, there's an interest to ensure peace and stability. Business cannot really thrive in a profitable way where there is corruption and systemic abuse of power. As a matter of fact, corruption is the biggest single barrier towards development. It's a huge transaction cost for business and it's also a tax on the poor. Jobs, obviously, most jobs come from the private sector. It's a public interest, but it's private sector investment. Even in all the other areas which are on the global agenda today, education, food, health, environment, climate, water, the private sector, through its innovation, its capacity, is the key driver behind almost everything. And no single challenge today could anymore be solved without private sector contribution. Now, this chart, I think, is very important because it shows you where the overlap is. And where the overlap is, there's a shared interest, at least in theory, that the private sector is part of the solution for public policy priorities. And vice versa, the public sector has an interest to engage the private sector in a way, not only for its own profit and growth motive, which is the driver in making all this possible, but also to produce the public goods, including peace, sustainable development, human rights as some of the core values I put up here. So I want you to keep this relationship in mind because it's genuinely the foundation of collaboration and of making the case for engagement across a variety of issues. We are promoting 10 principles. These principles are not coming out of thin air. They are derived from decades of deliberations from governments, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we are asking companies to respect human rights and to support them where possible. Uh, there are basic, basic fundamental principles on how you treat your work as well. They're called fundamental principles and rights at work, very basic. There are very basic environmental caretaking principles which suggest that companies should use when having a choice, the superior model of environmental stewardship and not use some cheaper old uh, pollution intensive method. And then the tenth principle, the most complicated one of all, is the anti-corruption. Ever since the UN enacted a convention against corruption, we also introduced that principle and we challenge business to make its own contribution to work towards ending bribery and corruption in all of its forms. So we are principle-based and these are the principles we propose to CEOs. We say, if you can live by these principles, if you can make them part of your own organization, your strategy and operations, then you're welcome. Do so in a very public manner. Make your commitment known. Share it with your employees. Empower your employees with the principles. Be proud of it to embrace basic ethics. And there's an obligation, at least one. Do actually mean what you say and implement your commitment and strive to continuously improve your organization. We are not expecting companies to be perfect from day one, but we expect that companies that engage have a desire to continuously improve. And that's why we introduced a, a mandatory disclosure framework. It's not checked or verified by us, bureaucrats, never ever, but it's verified and checked by the communities where the companies operate. It's transparency and disclosure on these issues. And corporations which fail to do a disclosure are actually delisted from the initiative. So a commitment is quite serious because it has to be honored. And it has to be honored in a public, transparent way, where the verification of the content is up to the stakeholders to whom it is actually meant to be. We have two overarching strategic goals, how we approach this whole uh, big idea of engaging business to advance public goods. One is obviously what you could call organizational change, driving the principles into organizations along the rough outlines I just said. The second goal, however, is to also be a partner, to act very concretely on specific 
dilemmas or problems that are close to your core business, but that also have a public good character, be it on community investment, be it on supporting health services, being on using your supply chain in such a way that small-scale farmers actually improve their capacity. So this is the second goal, it's the taking action. And the taking action usually happens, obviously, in partnerships, in collaboration, because no actor alone can of often move a mountain. You need a whole army of aligned, like-minded people who want to do likewise. And this collaboration is increasingly becoming important. I'll come to that in a moment. But it's important to see the two distinct goals. They're very complementary. We call it track one and track two. Uh, and we encourage both equally. And they actually complement each other. When a company is committed to be ethically and environmentally sustainable and socially responsive, then it has a natural desire to also engage and to be actively part of the solution. So it's like an entry point and it reinforces the action part. So principles and action are two sides of the same coin. Now, just very briefly, the idea initially was just a speech by the former Secretary General Kofi Annan. It then took on quite rapidly. Initially, there were only 43 companies who dared to come to the United Nations, and we replaced the member states' names with the corporate names, which caused a small revolution within the UN. <laughs> uh, in the ECOSOC chamber, you had uh, brand names of companies and not the nation states. Uh, these were the 43 early uh, founding participants. And as you can see, there has been a gradual uh, uh, move, uh, an increase, and the blue uh, ones are actually, sadly, the delistings, companies who have not or are not doing an annual disclosure on their progress. Many of them are falling victim to mergers and acquisitions, so it isn't quite as tragic as it looks like, but still there's a high degree of free riders, unfortunately, or CEOs and leadership has changed and the new one decided not to carry forward. It is a big struggle for us now because we kind of got stuck now at 7,200 and every month 150 new companies are joining, but equally 100 or so are also being delisted. So we're currently making huge efforts to improve retention and to uh, think on incentive structures for disclosure and reporting. In the developed world, this is not difficult because companies not only are used to transparency much more and the regulatory requirements in many countries are actually enormous, but in many emerging markets and developing countries, the infrastructure and the marketplace for such information doesn't exist. So we also have to work on creating the demand and the marketplace. This speaks also to many of the issues you're dealing here with, free speech, you need a lively press, you want a civil society community that speaks its mind and so forth. These are all critical components for this growth. But we continue to grow quite rapidly and we have in the meantime 101 country networks. These are clusters of participants who self-organize then and build their own global compact at country level with professional staff behind them who facilitate and enable partnerships, dialogue and learning and increasingly do all sorts of projects and initiatives. We probably have, I don't know, but something like 2,000 projects are running under the Global Compact, from anything from environmental stewardship to anti-corruption, from women empowerment to children's causes. It's a huge area of activity, which is wonderful. And for this, obviously, you need bottom-up buy-in. You need the conviction of the local players uh, to believe in it. And this is where my real good experience comes after having traveled so much around the world. In every country, you find aspiring entrepreneurs who want to be successful, who want to grow, who want to integrate in the global marketplace. And because of the value chain connection with many multinational corporations, a values-based approach to business is often seen as a fast track of moving upward. And it's a good thing because it connects companies. It's like a, a connectivity between local and global and it brings also the local standards upwards towards a higher global standards. And we ask our big global champions to 
invest especially in local operations and to adopt at least one, one local network, if possible in a least developed country where markets are weakest, where the demand for such support is obviously greatest. And this is all happening without any government intervention and I'm very proud of this because I firmly believe that for creating sustainable networks they need to be genuinely private sector led and there needs to be a business case and the business case needs to be clear and understood. When government would to throw in money, which occasionally they want to do and which they do do, then there's a high risk that the recipient becomes used to receiving money and the whole incentive structure gets actually skewed. Therefore, we actually prefer purely private business-led network creation. That is a, a, a critical insight we have learned. This is just a chart, I won't go into detail, but it explains the business case when we explain, say, why should you join the Global Compact? When DuPont or General Electric came to us and said, you know, why should we do this? We have practices on environmental compliance, we have a human resource department, we have all the modules in place. Well, there are very strong cases why uh, universal principles give you what you could call almost a passport that is understood everywhere because it's a unifying framework where everybody can relate to. And that sales pitch is quite uh, strong in some cases, but more specifically, we also know from many analysis that the deeper a company engages, the steeper the learning curve and the stronger the value proposition. When you start early on and you adopt as a, as a defensive uh, tactic to defect yourself against possible liabilities or risks, your gains are actually fairly small. But once you really run your organization on a conviction that transparency, stakeholder engagement, and a positive alignment with the challenges is a winning formula, then you actually can become a trendsetter and you actually can set the rules of the market and you will achieve leadership in your segment. It's a necessary precondition. So this is the business case chart, which is quite important for executives, obviously, what's in it employment, motivation. It is, of course, about risk mitigation because you are prepared, you have the systems in place, you know how to handle it. And of course, it is about opportunity spotting because every challenge is also an opportunity. Poverty in that regard is a huge opportunity to build markets, the base of the pyramid concept and so forth. So with that kind of thinking, you can actually turn it into a very positive framing and it does work. So that is, has to do with how deeply companies are engaged, depending how strong the business case is. Now, we also developed, because we realized with 7,000 companies, it's very difficult to keep the motivation going. It's a systems challenge. And our mission in life is, unfortunately, not to create a club. We could have created a club of the 1,000 sustainability leaders and become a tea-drinking party and being very happy with a membership fee. But unfortunately, our mission is to win over the world. And it's a big world with at least 70,000 multinationals out there with investments in more than one country, at least. And many, many millions of SMEs who are connected in one way or the other through the global value chain. Therefore, we had to introduce concepts such as differentiation. In other words, you have to create incentives for leadership to stay engaged. Otherwise, they jump ship and go maybe to the competition or <laughs> they may find it boring because uh, the innovators genuinely want to move forward. So to keep the pace and the direction going, that's why we introduced the leadership concept and we defined three dimensions of it, which uh, 60 CEOs now have embraced and they run with it on a very serious manner. And this uh, speaks both to the core activities, the CEO commitment, the board adoption and oversight, it's not just an individual commitment, but in the case of publicly listed companies, it's now also adoption by the board. Uh, it means a firm commitment to stakeholder engagement and, of course, a firm commitment to transparency and disclosure, not being afraid of it. And then there are the three dimensions of engagement which uh, speak uh, for itself. Within the company, we expect full coverage of all the issue areas that should usually and is reflected in a robust, solid, good management system. It means that it's, it's diffused across all the functions of the company and doesn't get stuck just in one department or is managed just as an add-on to the CEO when he gives speaking engagements. 
And of course, the big challenge is the supply and the value chain, because through sourcing, there's an enormous leverage how you can build capacities and you can inspire. Uh, and that's where many of the challenges still are. And then, of course, there's the taking action. The second goal I spoke about, that is either aligned with the core business or its strategic social investment and philanthropy, which is welcome, of course, but it's not a precondition. And we encourage, of course, also positive advocacy on critical policy issues, say anti-corruption. We want CEOs to speak up against it. We want them to use their power to influence policymaking at local level, to convince the policymaker that this is not a pathway towards competitiveness. This is a pathway somewhere else. And of course, we encourage partnerships and collective action. And in a selfish way, it is of course engagement in the platform. And I think I do not want to go into details now, otherwise I get lost in technical details, but differentiation also uh, cuts across disclosure. There are different ways how companies can choose as a beginner, as an advanced, or as a leader. And in the meantime, there are many very concrete, what we call issue platforms, where companies can collaborate. Because ultimately, no single company, even not the world number one in value uh, 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 valuation, has the capacity to really change some of the fundamental dilemmas. That's where collaboration of like-minded companies for the shared goal is increasingly important. And that's why we have what we call big platforms on climate action, on water management, on women's empowerment, on children's issues, and so forth. And in these platforms, companies can pool or co-invest their good intentions, so to speak. And the benefit is not necessarily brand differentiation for each individual company, but the benefit, of course, is changing the enabling environment within each. All of them are working. And then the trade-off, of course, is a much better environment for doing business, growth for everybody, and including, and hopefully especially those who take the leading role in making that transformation happen. This is just a quick uh, uh, chart to show you how we assess our own impact, and there's a detailed survey upcoming uh, in uh, four weeks, which goes into great detail. We know for sure that already it has had an impact on thousands of companies on a quite large scale, it's very hard to translate this into life saved or water conserved or environmental degradation avoided, very hard. But uh, obviously, when such leverages of corporate activities are implied, there's huge impact and footprint involved, and the scale is quite uh, major. Another interesting observation is, and uh, this is quite important for us, a lot still has to be done, obviously, and it's a very imperfect world. But we know for sure that those who are deeper and who are longer in the initiative, the dark one, have a far higher rate, for example, on disclosure, for example. And that is the accumulated learning effect of organizations over time. Big organizations hardly change overnight, except there is a crisis. Therefore, if you pursue the continuous performance improvement pathway, which is the standard model for management change, then it's the annual progress you want to see. And it actually does work, because you can see in all of our core issue areas, those companies who have been in much longer have a much higher standing there. But it's a world still long to go. And this chart always brings me back to reality, because it shows how far we still have to go. Even among our companies, only one out of five, roughly, has aligned their public affairs policies with their corporate sustainability policies, meaning companies has still have a long way to go to, to really also talk what they preach or walk what they talk. You can name it either way, but there are still disconnectivities uh, and there's still a need for greater alignment. And uh, that is obviously something we have to continuously work on. Finally, I want to share just some thoughts on you on the future. The UN is currently uh, making a big investment on the new global development goals. I very much hope they will also uh, include corruption as a goal or getting rid of it, because in the absence of that, I don't believe much progress can be made in many places around the world. Uh, but uh, here is our model assumption how the private sector is part of the solution. 
One is obviously at the local level, how the private sector is increasingly willing and able to invest, to do so in a responsible way, to create employment and to improve living conditions. And that is obviously key. Supporting local entrepreneurship is arguably the most promising pathway to advanced development. And that, of course, often happens with global companies who work with local, either through supply chain, subsidiaries, and other relations. And that's where global and local is so deeply connected in the business world. And both global and local can advance shared goals in the two tracks. One is in their own footprint. It matters whether companies practice environmental stewardship. It matters whether companies treat their workers well. It matters whether they invest in their supply chain and build capacities or just cut them off. Uh, so that's what they do within their own operation. But at the same time, the collaborative arm, the second one, oh, this uh, is obviously very important. Are companies investing in shared platforms? Are companies willing to be a partner in a collective action uh, is a critical issue. So we are currently trying very hard to make the case for co-investment in shared solutions where individual companies actually do not carry all the burden, but they share it with others like-minded who also want to see progress, but alone can't do it. And to create these kind of movements and platforms, I believe personally is the key for tackling many of the future challenges we are facing. And organizationally to do that is often not so difficult because all you need really is facilitation and enablement. Business has the resources, the innovation, the skills to make many, many things happen. But often what is missing is the supportive enabling environment. So I firmly believe that this is one pathway where uh, a lot of difference can be made. If I look into the future and uh, the question where what are the biggest threat, I would say the biggest threat is that countries turn against each other, are becoming protectionist. That would be an end, not just for the compact, but an end for commerce, trade, and uh, everything humanity has been striving for after World War II. I consider a willingness and a commitment to engagement, openness, non-discrimination to be fundamentally important for creating a sustainable global marketplace, and we need to invest in it, to cultivate it. We cannot take it for granted, very important. Number two is that there are too many divergences, that individual markets turn in a totally different trackway. Say state capitalism becomes a new paradigm and runs against the fundamental principles of free markets in a sense that competition ultimately is the winner. So these are some of the big uh, challenges ahead, I would argue. Other than that, uh, the emphasis on innovation is always relevant. Business innovation also for development, it's phenomenal about the many new initiatives that are taking place now with IT companies. It's just phenomenal what is happening on the natural resource side, on the resource efficiency, on transformation, the horizontal economy, very, very exciting. And it opens many opportunities also for emerging and developing markets to leapfrog the classic development uh, phases that this country and Europe went through, industrialization. It wasn't without pain. We don't know because we were not born then, but history books tell us that child labor on Sunday was almost the norm not too long ago. Imagine that. And often development economists believe, you know, the industrialization model, the classic one, is the only one. Absolutely wrong. Technological change has empowered us to leapfrog many, many of the mistakes we have made in the past and to generate new opportunities. So these are my, my general thoughts. I think uh, the role of business is of fundamental importance. I also believe that it's very important that business is willing to be ethical. Remember, there's always a choice. There could be a vodka capitalism form. Uh, there could be a very short-term orientation on profits only at the expense of the public good. That would undermine the very fundamentals of, of uh, society as a whole. So I believe this is very important. The good news is that the business case for integrating environmental, social and governance issues into strategy and operations is increasingly recognized. Economists 
name it the materiality of non-traditional financial issues, and investors are increasingly developing benchmarks and frameworks so that in investment analysis and decision making, these issues are also reflected. So in valuation also, companies are valued not only by their short-term cash flow situation, but also on their position and how they stand in their ability to deal with these issues. And there's a huge investor movement going on currently uh, around the world, uh, which is advancing this thinking very much. It also has a lot to do with short-term versus long-term, because if your time horizon is just 24 hours or three months, then maybe you don't care what is in month number four or in hour 26, so long as you have a maximum return in financial terms. But if your valuation perspective is a bit longer, and actually the longer it is, I would argue the better, then obviously these externalities all of a sudden have a real value in your discounting. Tragedy is that current accounting practices have not yet internalized that thinking because in the standard discounting methodology uh, using benchmarks from the financial markets, we basically discount future damages that happen after five years with a net present value of almost zero, uh, which is obviously wrong, I would argue. Uh, but uh, that is a fundamental structural deficiency that I think uh, we all have to overcome. So moving from short term to long term is fundamentally important as well. Principles are not an enforcement. It's not law. It's extremely voluntary. The relationship between voluntary and regulatory, in my mind, is very complementary. It is not a question either or. Obviously, you need both. Uh, the law is the lowest common denominator below which a society is willing to enforce compliance. Enforcing compliance is costly. Where the bar of that is being laid depends on each country. But above the law, you need something which is non-codified, where people know what is right and wrong without having it as a law. Very important. It's a non-codified principle, trust-based behavior. The more of that trust share you have in society, the better the lower the transaction costs, by the way, the less you need lawyers. Uh, so I would argue that uh, you know, voluntary contribution is actually to complement all this and to reinforce, if you so want, the good intention. It is not a silver bullet for all of the problems out there, but it's one contribution. Thank you very much. In one of your initial slides, you talked about the private and the public um, sector and the interest there. And under the private was profit. So I was just wondering, what is the incentive for uh, corporations to join this program? Is it purely altruistic, or is there a different reason? Yeah, no, it's a very hard business case. Uh, it's, it's, the proposition is, if you ignore environmental, social, and governance issues, you run a huge risk of costly mistakes, and you miss out on important opportunities. Because if you embrace ethical, transparency, stakeholder engagement, you actually are in a winning position. Your own employees will love it. The talented people whom you want to source from the marketplace, they want to actually work for you because your reputation is good. Uh, and uh, more generally speaking, it's easier for you to go global because going global ultimately means being able to be local everywhere. And if you have a set of universal principles that are understood everywhere, it's actually easier to make that step. So our proposition is a, very, is a business case proposition. It is not altruistic. We welcome philanthropy, you know, of course, uh, but it's not really what we are uh, pushing for or promoting. It's self-enlightened interest. Uh, and. Uh, we are happy to, there's tons of material on, on the business case. And this one slide where I showed the business case gives you the different reasons at the different stages of engagement. And I have another uh, overview page here with me, which I meant to make available, which is the economic proof uh, on the business proposition of the uh, environmental, social, and governance issues and how relevant they are in valuation over time. So there's a, a very sound proof from many academics now coming forward uh, showing that companies which actually embrace principles and drive them into the operations, that on average they are outperforming those which are not. And those which are not are either facing higher risks 
higher liabilities, higher costs, they have lower motivation within the organization, and they find it more difficult to access markets. And they may also have it more difficult to get the perfect suppliers they want, or they're in a weaker negotiating position. A classic example from a country level, which I like to quote here, and I, I, I generally don't like to give corporate examples for all sorts of reasons, but uh, we, with the Tanzanian government, when they uh, changed recently their law for mining extraction, uh, and uh, we were also consulted there, and there were two, two uh, sides. One side was, you know, make the environmental requirements as low as possible so we get as many offers as, we, as possible. But the other side was arguing, actually, if you make the environmental requirements higher, you actually may get better offers. And, you know, the people living around the mines are actually better off. Surprise, surprise, the s more stringent environmental requirements actually attracted much more attractive offers. Why? Because the big mining companies are very concerned about their brand image uh, when, <laughs> when mining in uh, developing countries. And they actually appreciate when there are environmental safeguards in place rather than they, they move into a, a land, a country, where there's no regulatory provision for anything. And that's a fundamental change, by the way, in the business world. That's where I really want to challenge also the business community. who Look at this agenda. Uh, here's the government pushing for regulation. We are the free enterprises. We hate regulation. I think we live in a different world now, where actually smart, smart regulation support the good performers. And we hear many companies now calling for better performance standards in critical areas, because this would actually drive the business of the advanced performers. So it's, a, it's an interesting case, I would argue, that speaks to the business proposition of what we are doing and not to the philanthropy. You were talking about one of the greatest risks that we face right now is the new paradigm shift towards state uh, capitalism. And I was wondering if you could more address that specifically with what's going on with Greece and kind of their move towards nationalism and fascism and, and developing countries in uh, other markets that have high mineral resources and just kind of continue to talk about that. Well, it's a very uh, sensitive subject, uh, obviously. I mean, state capitalism, uh, state ownership is not a bad thing. And remember, half of the Nordic countries who don't have a bad track record in many areas are actually state-owned of the publicly listed companies. But the market environment is fully enforced, so it's not run as a national company with national uh, interests, but rather the ownership happens to be the pension fund of uh, who knows. So uh, I personally think the biggest risk humanity is facing, repeating obviously the mistakes of the past. Uh, we had two world wars in the last century. We had enormous tragedies around the world where nationalism and all forms of isms uh, caused enormous damage, uh, populism often uh, enormously dangerous. And in the end of the day, it's a political world where you know public opinion easily can be uh, cheered into all sorts of propositions. And the marketplace actually needs rules. The marketplace ne needs accessibility. The marketplace needs the space for competition to grow. And uh, nationalism, inward orientation, protectionism undermine competition. They undermine the free exchange. They undermine the possibility for the best solutions to travel fast. They actually usually almost always add sink costs. They are almost always uh, inferior. So, and around the world, I, I do witness also very disturbingly a weakening for multilateralism, for a rule-based marketplace. Classic liberal, liberalism that shaped the post-World War II agenda is almost forgotten now. The young generation oft doesn't know anymore how to spell non-discrimination in trade. It's a fundamental principles for how one member st uh, state treats the other. Very, very important. I, I'm very concerned that we forget all this. And uh, populism is always the danger around the corner and the other forms of isms, uh, extremisms, and so forth. And as you know, many parts around the world are near explosion points. I'm going to the Lebanon shortly with a prime minister to launch the compact there. And the exclusive intention is to contribute to stability, to mobilize the like-minded business voices, to calm down the extremists, to explain that jobs, security, predictability, for markets are essential for improving the state of 
humanity. And therefore, you know, peace and stability are key. So there are always these dark forces going on around the world. And I fear we are in a critical time because the financial crisis has questioned a little bit the Western model in many parts around the world. It has undermined a bit of credibility. Uh, it is not so easy anymore to, to spread this uh, word, so to speak. But uh, there are many followers uh, everywhere. And uh, we have to just uh, invest in that much more. I also firmly believe that the biggest experiment we really are undertaking here is are we capable of creating a global marketplace? Are we capable of really allowing integration based on non-discrimination to happen? This was the vision of the post-World War architects. Are we really able to do that? Or do we fall back in the old temptation of inward orientation, protectionism and narrow, narrow goal setting on populist grounds with all the ugly isms that in the past we had to deal with? So we should be concerned. We should be very concerned. And this is why it's so important to always stress the good side of cooperation and the good side of and the benefits of what it brings. I know a lot of economists like William Easterly would argue that as far as development is concerned, institutions is really the key as to how you're going to develop lots of these countries. Um, how would you say that Global Compact and corporations adopting these principles, do you think that actually impacts the institutions of these countries into better developing their countries? Or, or, or maybe there isn't an example of that, I don't know. I, in principle, yes, because when you want to get rid of corruption, the first place you go to is public procurement and you want to change the policies for public procurement to, and create more effective uh, public institutions. Absolutely. I, in principle, yes. Uh, but I would uh, put a, a quotation. Uh, I have some doubts about the statement uh, that institution building is the way to go. As a matter of fact, personally, I think almost the opposite. I, I, I sometimes jokingly say you have two choices in life, you know. Uh, you institutionalize a problem or you solve it. Uh, in other words, <laughs> it's a bit extreme, I know, but uh, uh, the point really is the action is what really matters because institutions will follow what is necessary to codify them and to make it happen. But the far more part is the Creation Act, the Investment Act. Uh, then you create hope, you create jobs, and then of course, uh, you need some institutional arrangements to ensure that the right rules are also effectively implemented. But every country there has a different history and every country presumably is at a different uh, pathway. You mentioned that it's, it's really important to not to, to use government power or government funding to, to replace something in the market that should be done privately. But, but where it's not happening in the developing world, for instance, how, how, I guess, do you have any insight of how to make the transition from government to private? Yes, I have uh, some very radical proposals, and I may want to share them offline, uh, because my UN colleagues will probably uh, expel me. But uh, uh, in essence, I think the short answer is empowering small em entrepreneurs, giving rights and entitlements to the poor, uh, enabling opportunities to unfold. It's heartbreaking when you go to some informal marketplace in any big city in any developing country and you see these many craftsmen who are talented, gifted, dedicated and who would love to grow the informal business into something more viable. But the red tape of the institution doesn't allow it because there sits a petty uh, bureaucrat who charges bribes uh, he can't afford. Uh, which in turn has another story, of course, he's underpaid too. Uh, we have to be fair. So, uh, but I think empowerment and entitlement of basic rights is a certain good pathway to get there. And we encourage very much entrepreneurship through the supply chain. Many companies now invest collectively even in micro funds for startups. Social entrepreneurship is big on the move for good reasons, very important. With IT, you can now provide much more better connectivity, either by issues. There are new portals. For example, on our website, you will see a CO Water Mandate Action Hub. 
I kindly invite you to visit that Action Hub because there are probably 200 projects uh, being done just by connecting the right people with each other. And you can do this by issue, by theme, by geography. Wonderful, wonderful. This wasn't possible 10 years ago. So there are many ways of empowerment and support, uh, very powerful. But it also means, I think, a change of mindset in, in the policymakers in uh, many countries around the world. And it's very sad, but uh, very talented engineers who graduate, I say now the University of Dar es Salaam because I happen to know it, their, their desire is to sit behind a desk and to sign papers yeah? as an engineer. I mean, they should have the desire to, <laughs> to improve other things. <laughs> so uh, it's the incentive structure. And this is my point, you know, what does society reward? Does it reward entrepreneurship, value creation, or does it reward short profit or aid attraction for other purposes? That's a bit extreme too, I'm aware, but in essence, that's a fundamental issue. I am very firmly behind it. You talked a lot about principle-based ethics, and I'm just curious how you would recommend uh, countries or states teaching principle-based ethics to uh, growing generations, both in public education and in the homes? I'm, I'm quite convinced that ethics matter a lot. The ability to define between right and wrong is fundamentally important, no doubt. I have great respect and admiration for those people who, who dedicate their life to that. Uh, I think it's very important to be part of education. Uh, in the end of the day, uh, free people make choices, and one would hope that people make the right choices. Decision-making is about choices. Uh, investment decision-making is about making choices. So uh, to promote that kind of thinking is, of course, uh, an enormously challenging uh, issue, and that's why I'm so pleased to be here, because this institution is part of such a movement, which is extremely valuable and important. And I wish that were to happen much more often in many more places around the world. I think the world also has been a little bit sidetracked by the uh, fantasy that you know, short-term richness is <laughs> possible for everybody. Uh, I'm not making now a direct uh, connection to 2008 and the financial crisis, but I think we, uh, it is quite important that value creation you know, requires dedication and it requires a long-term perspective on, on issues. And that's, uh, I think, is important also in, in ethics teaching, and there are some very important uh, principles, I think, that need to be honored. On human rights and related issues, there, is a f there are two very important concepts which I would like to briefly uh, lay out before you. One is called the respect notion. You know, you want companies and individuals not to harm not to do damage, if avoidable. That means respect human rights. But you also want to encourage, where possible, to support, and that's the active part, where you can to do something good that helps. You want to get rid of discrimination, you want to end child labor, even if it's not your immediate uh, responsibility. We encourage that, obviously. And it's the balance between respect and support so to speak, which defines the boundaries of, of this ethical world uh, uh, within the principles. And within respect, obviously, no gross violation or intended violation. There are then different graduations. Uh, in rare cases, was there a bad intention from the beginning? Often it's negligence, often it's ignorance. Uh, on the support notion, there is a lot you can learn together with others. That's where partnerships are so important pooling efforts, collaborating, and going beyond your immediate self-interest and investing in shared platforms, knowing that this will advance the common good, which ultimately will also benefit you as a company or as an individual.